Shall I start? Just give me a minute. I'll introduce you. Just just letting the people in. How do you know how many people there are? I can see the bottom of my screen. The participant numbers are mm -hmm. going up. I don't know if it if it flashes up on your screen as well, but yeah, I can see them. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to mute myself for now? No, no, you're part of it. I just yeah, yeah but for now you when yeah, you're not speaking, you, you mute just, if everybody mutes themselves while they're not speaking, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Well, okay, I think we're ready to go. Hello and good evening to everyone. My name is Amina Yakin and I'm the director of the SOAS Festival of Ideas. This is day five and we are at 5 p.m. Uh, live with our book talk. It's very exciting. Um, we've been talking, um, we started on Monday with decolonizing knowledge. We started with speaking to uh, Professor Adam Habib, who is um, at WITS and the director there, and he's our incoming director at SOAS this, from this January. And we were talking about the flows of knowledge um, from the from the global south set in south africa and about how funding um, is located in the higher education sector and what that um, in what ways does it contribute to the colonizing or decolonizing of knowledge now decolonizing of knowledge has uh, lots of variations across the board whether we talk about it in terms of the history of uh, where we are of the history of the colonized peoples or we talk about it in terms of structures what are the structures that we currently live with so i'm um it's a great pleasure for me right now to welcome our two speakers for this session, um, Professor Yasmin Alipai Brown, who actually needs no introduction, but I will still give her an introduction, and Nyla Nevi, Levy to, to the program. And um, they will both be in conversation about Yasmin's new book, uh, Ladies Who Punch. Before that, I'll just give them a brief introduction. Yasmin Alipai Brown was exiled from her birthplace, Uganda, in 1972. She's a journalist, broadcaster, author and columnist on the I newspaper and Sunday Times magazine. She has written for The Guardian, Observer, Sunday Times, Mail on Sunday, Daily Mail, New York Times, Time magazine and other publications. She has won several awards, including the Orwell Prize for Political Writing and in 2017 National Press Awards Columnist of the Year Prize. And she um, is com being commended for this prize again in 2018. Amongst her many accolades is the role of a part time professor of journalism at Middlesex University and governor of the Royal Shakespeare Company. For 10 years, she was co-chair of Major Imperial College Health Trust research project headed by Lord Aradarzai on patient safety. She's a national and international public speaker, a consultant on diversity and inclusion and trustee of various arts organizations. She's co-founder of the charity British Muslims for Secular Democracy. Her recent books include Refusing the Veil, Exotic England, about England's infatuation with the East. And I've had the pleasure of being in conversation with, with Yasmin about some of her work. Um, and uh, she is currently directing a program of research into the well-being of troubled young Muslims and uh, has published an excellent report that I highly recommend uh, read you to read. She has twice been just just in case you you think she has uh, she doesn't have influence she has twice been voted the 10th most influential asian in britain so yasmin we are very proud of you her new polemic her latest book was defense of political correctness uh, and her book ladies who punch is just hot off the press this september i can wave it around uh, she has eight honorary degrees and she sits on the boards of arts organizations. She's also a keen cook and theater buff. And, and Yasmin, as soon as, as this period is over, I'm still waiting for my dinner invitation and this home cooked meal that is yet to transpire amongst over our various conversations that have taken place. Um, I mean, I'm a huge admirer of Yasmin's work. Her 
contributions have influenced me as well over the time and interactions during the Muslims Trust and Cultural Dialogue project, having worked with her on a report that came out on Prevent um, with, with Peter. And that that's really been um, very, very important insight into how Yasmin works and the kind of community drive that her work is informed by, which is uh, so necessary and so important in terms of where we are in public life in the in the UK and in the world globally. And um, in conversation with her is um, Naila Levy, who is a playwright and actor. She's mixed race, Pakistani and Canadian with Muslim and Jewish heritage and born and bred in London. Naila has always gravitated towards stories that explore experiences related to identity, culture and race. Naila began in verbatim with her first play, Different is Dangerous, Amnesty International Freedom of Expression Longlist nominee, followed by Normal with a bit of oomph, and most recently, Does My Bomb Look Big in This, co-produced by Tamasha, which toured the UK, including Soho Theatre and Schools. Nyla is part of Soho Theatre Soho 6, where she is developing her next play. She's currently writing episodes for two popular TV shows whilst developing her original ideas for Screen 2. So a warm welcome to Yasmin and Nyla. It's a pleasure to have you um, on this particular evening. And also Nyla is one of the ladies who punch in, in Yasmin's book. And I know Yasmin's going to say a lot about her book. So I'm just going to get my few words in while I can and before she starts. Um, I mean, it's a fantastic title, Ladies Who Punch. And I was going to ask you um, why, uh, well, this, this is a question that I'll come back to about uh, why ladies and why not women? Um, and I think you are you will answer it in your in your kind of presentation. But it's um, what I really liked about the introduction to the book is that you say the diverse characters in the book are accidental trailblazers, and that is a really important insight into the inspirational role models that are included in this book. And I think also one of the things we've been talking about in, in the Decolonizing Knowledge series of talks is about um, this not just only being about the history of the Global South that we're engaging with, but also the history of where we live and where we are right now. How do we rethink that? And why do we need to rethink that in terms of reclaiming uh, knowledge for ourselves? And I think especially with regards to um, the stories of women, I, I just want to pick up some facts from your book, which, which are quite shocking. The UK has fallen from 15th to 21st down the global rankings for gender equality. You note that in the book. And um, also you note the landmark um, equal pay case that the BBC journalist Samira Ahmed one um, with regards to being underpaid by £700,000 um, for hosting the audience feedback show Newswatch compared with Jeremy Vine's salary for points of view. Uh, the UK FTSE's 350 firms, you say, offer pitiful and patronising reasons why their boardrooms are dominated by men. And the excuses are really quite shocking. Most women don't want the hassle or pressure of sitting on a board. I love that. So um, I think the institutional sexism that you talk about and the opportunities that deny um, women their space in, in society and where they go is, is something that's very passionately argued in this book, and I can't wait to hear more. So I'm going to hand over to you, Yasmin. Um, welcome. We can't hear you. Can you unmute? Um, uh, just to refer back to the decolonization, um, um, unending, if you like, struggle. It's very interesting that, of course, we could very soon be breaking the law if we talk about this, because a, a minister actually of African background, a Tory minister of African background, has spoken of the last few days. Um, sorry, can you hear me? 
Yes, we can. You're absolutely fine. Um, is suggesting that any talk of decolonizing knowledge or um, telling untold stories or challenging uh, the common narratives could be illegal. So watch the space. And the other thing that I think, for me, decolonization of anything is for everybody. So James Baldwin wrote um, in The Fire Next Time um, to his, a letter to his nephew, James, saying, white people are locked in a history they barely understand. And whatever we do, we must help them unlock that history. Because nobody's helped by having a false uh, story about their history and their nation. So I think this is a collective thing. Um, we all need it. And we all need to take, tell the truths as well about, you know, people from the South and people from the East. We're not angels. We have our own bad histories. The story of slavery. Um, as the recent program she said, um, it's a world shame. It's a world shame. Um, a lot of Asians in East Africa, in the coastal region, were agents of, of slave traders. Um, you know, we need to be talking in a much more holistic way about all this. And that kind of leads to the book. I, I really was beginning to think that we, we, Identity politics is, in part, a very important step in self-understanding and the understanding of the nation. But it can and often does become, become a cul-de-sac. The story of women in Britain, and I restricted the, the stories to British women or women who came to Britain. Um, if, we, if we look at the range of women who did what they did, because it was inside them. Some of them weren't even very nice. I don't like a lot of these women. But what they did, what they felt they had to do was to say, they're not going to stay in the space that is allocated to them, the roles that are given to them. And this is a collective history. And oh, it's, if you look at the, the books on feminism, you have books on white feminism, you have books on black feminism. And I wanted to bring together every you know the, a, a range of women class race background region to say this is the changes we are enjoying came because women of all backgrounds did what they did and that's very important to me because i'm from the tradition of you know when we had rock against racism when we had the anti-nazi league when we had the anti-racist alliance and so in a way, the political edge of this book is saying, this is a collective um, um, venture. Women around the world often suffer the same awful oppressions, even in middle classes in the West. It helps us to be stronger if we are together. It helps men uh, you know, carry on the way they are doing if we only, if we box ourselves off. And I feel that very passionately. Some viewers may disagree with me. So choosing the 50 women, I had that in mind, that it had to, you'll see in the cover, there are three fists. And one is white, one, uh, one is black, one is white, one is brown. And, and the re reason for calling it ladies who punch is I wanted these very punchy lady but also you know that um, um, expression they use ladies who lunch these useless rich women who go around eating lettuce uh, and, and drinking champagne and I thought I always thought that was a very cruel slur and I wanted to use that and change it into ladies who punch so it, because it comes from ladies who lunch I, I didn't want it to be women one of the biggest questions was how and who do you choose? I decided it had to have three parts. The first part was remember them, women who are no longer with us, but who have completely been part of the feminist or 
women's equality story. We must always remember them. And there are hundreds more of these women. The middle part was heed them, the women who are here and now, from doing a whole range of things, a whole range of things. Not all of them are militant, not all of them are feminists, not all of them, uh, you know, kind of have entered battle, but they are absolutely refusing to stay in their boxes. And the third part where lovely Nyla is, is mark them, the coming generation. I have so much hope for the coming generation. After Me Too happened, I thought, wow, what young women are able to do. You know, Weinstein, everybody knew in Hollywood what he was like. Meryl Streep knew, um, every Hollywood actress knew. Uh, all of them knew what he was like. But for all sorts of reasons, which I understand, you know, that you want your career, you don't want to be thrown off. Um, they said nothing and it carried on. It took young women who had most to lose, who said enough is enough, he's, he's not going to get away with it anymore. And therefore I wanted a third section called Mark Them, because these women are so brave, so savvy. So we've got Laura, I've got Laura Bates in there, who, who <clears throat> set up the Everyday Sexism Project. And my heroine in the book is Renieta Lodge, that young black woman who wrote a, well, it's such a difficult title to remember why I'm not talking to white people about race anymore, still in the bestsellers list. It's the first book by a black writer to be in the bestsellers list as it is. She's so young, she's so confident, and she just will not surrender to some of the some of the stuff many of us feel we have to. You know, I can never say no to appear on television. And then I always come, often come back and say, why did I do that, right? Because it's become so confrontational. Rennie is still, and she says no. And I learned, I'm really old now. I learned so much from the younger women. And the, it's a joyous book. It's a really joyous book. You know, you read about Mira Sile, you read about um, Shazia Mirza, who's, I, completely love and it's also saying you know hey guys uh, you know we, we 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 laugh we wear beautiful clothes we love men good men who love us back um but you will not determine who we can be anymore and some of the historical characters that i've included again largely forgotten as um uh, um so, um, what's her name? I've forgotten his name now. Sarabji, um, Cornelia Sarabji, the first woman ever in the Victorian age to push and push the system and get to study law at Oxford. She fought those men who wouldn't let her take her exams. She fought those men for then two decades before they accepted her um, as, as a barrister before the bar accepted her. Who knew this? Who knows this story? Equally, there is Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who was the first ever woman doctor. So I wanted, it's a very joyous and energizing book. And it's, it's written in a way where, you know, my auntie could understand it because that's what we need also, is for, for books to speak to all kinds of people. But I wanted to bring Nyla in here, who's the youngest person in the book. And the reason I, and I'll, I'll let her talk about it, the reason I was captivated by her is I saw this play she wrote, Does, La, Does My Bomb Look Big in This? And it was, and as you know, you, you, you heard in the, in the earlier introduction, I love the theatre. And I was so blown away by this play, Nyla plays one of the Bethnal Green girls who went to join ISIS. But she's a Londoner and she plays it in that way. 
in that fast speaking way. Um, and it's poignant, it's incredibly important because it gives you an idea of what lies behind so much of this, this whole business of radicalization. It, it, and that's what led to this other work I've done with young, about young Muslims. So Naila, I want to hand over to you. And if you can talk about yourself, like you did to me, and, um, and, and what you're doing. Yeah, I guess, um, well, I'm now a writer, um, as Amina had introduced me as earlier, but I, uh, I kind of never, ever, ever saw myself becoming a writer. I always wanted to be an actress when I was younger. Um, so I actually only started writing kind of to get myself on stage, actually. Um, and that kind of happened at university. But I think um, which we've we'd been talking about decolonization before. And when I'd first kind of been asked, oh, why don't we talk about that at the beginning of this? I immediately just thought of like me decolonizing my own mind. And I think that that has actually been, um, that kind of started when I was at university and started writing. Uh, because the first play that I did write with my friend at uni was uh, Different is Dangerous, which was a verbatim play where we interviewed members of the Asian community up in Leeds. And that kind of forced me to reflect on my own culture. I'm mixed race. My dad's white, Canadian, Jewish, and my mum is, well, British Asian Muslim. Um, and I'd always felt very uh, defensive and, you know, I kind of wanted to hide my Asian side the whole, you know, my entire life really up until university when I was kind of forced to confront it and be like fuck that's wow okay this is this is what I'm ignoring this side of me and you know so I think just coming back to the decolonization I think um for me it's about decolonizing my own mind which is definitely like an ongoing process but um yeah I think through theatre and playing roles of Asian, you know, Asian girls, um, and then writing these roles, it's actually helped me really connect with that side of my identity, which I felt so strongly against and wanted to suppress um, all of my life growing up. Um, so yeah, so I, I mean, I've at the beginning of my career, kind of in 2012, um, I was just acting in anything that I could act in. <laughs> Uh, me and my friend had written that play Different is Dangerous and we'd applied to a Kamasha, which is a, a theatre company, um, a Kamasha scratch night. So we performed a 12 minute little short excerpt of it. And then um, that kind of just picked up some momentum. And then we ended up crowdfunding and taking ourselves to Edinburgh. Um, all very kind of like rehearsing in my kitchen after work um oh my god yeah we we had like a five day run up at edinburgh fringe and on the first day it was it was press night and so me and my friend fadia fadia Corman, um she, we were like oh my god press night amazing so cool and then we went to do our performance and nobody was there and then poor tech guy we were at the top of this we were in a hotel um on the royal mile at the top in the tiny room and the tech guy was like you have to invite press you know and we were like shit no one told us that we're like fuck <laughs> so he got a private private show that evening um but yeah a lot of uh, a lot of learning on the job is kind of how i've ended up uh getting to where i'm at uh because we self-produced um that show yeah yeah i think a lot of failure um has kind of taught me a lot of stuff, I guess. Um, yeah, I remember I was in Luton Hat Factory once and Fahim Qureshi, who'd come to see the show up at, at the Fringe, really liked it. And so we were talking about potential tour for the play. And then I suddenly realized I had to pitch the play to another person in the room. And I was like, okay, so now well, I'm apparently pitching. So it's a lot of kind of um, being thrown in at the deep end and then somehow getting to the surface. Uh, yeah, 
So I think that's what has been my journey really. Um, and then and then I did write, uh, does my bomb look big in this? It had been in development since 2016. And that was that was actually really kind of me just fed up of playing terrorists, girlfriends and having the shittest dialogue in the entire thing. Um, you know, I'm like, and I have always been interested in the story of the girls from Bethnal Green and you know, how, how what could happen, how, how could, what influenced them to make that journey? Um, and so I kind of started just writing stuff that, you know, I feel is like a British Asian, I'm mixed race Asian, but you know, I feel more Asian than I do white. I don't feel white because I've never really had benefits from being white. So I feel Asian. Um, so yeah, I used my own experience to kind of write up some dialogue, some random scenes. I didn't know where it was going. Um, and then after a couple of years of trying to get in touch with Tesney Mukunji, who um, represented the girls' families, uh, he finally agreed to meet with me after he read my play title. He was like, okay, that's interesting enough. I'll give you one interview. Um, and then, and then it was really interesting because I kind of had these uh, characters and asked him if he thought that they sounded true to, you know, the people that he'd met. And he was like, yeah, that actually sounds really, you know, you've got quite a few of them kind of bang on actually. Um, and so then I just tried to get, you know, a piece together what had actually happened to them in their life to make them vulnerable young people. Um, and so those trigger points in their life then became part of this. It's a fictional story. It's not actually the story of Shemima Begum. Um, yeah, so it was this kind of fictional exploration of what happens and the grooming process. And then at the heart of it are these two best friends, you know, Yasmin, who is the girl who joins ISIS. She's not actually, she's not practicing Muslim or anything. And then it's her poor friend, uh, Aisha, who gets left behind, who is actually, you know, she's Muslim and she has to deal with all of the shit, you know? So I kind of wanted to show what every Muslim in this country has to deal with when something like that happens, whilst also having these brilliant, funny, intelligent, uh, young Asian girls from London at the heart of it, just showing them as like real people. You know, I think uh, as an actor, I find a lot of the time, um, Asian people's dialogue is very formal and it's like we don't talk like that you know so it's like let's bring out the lols let's bring out these really fully rounded characters let's bring out fun characters for other actors to play as well um and for women to play and yeah just have fun with it I think um so yeah so that was kind of how I wrote Bomb um and now I'm like doing some tv stuff which is amazing off the back of it which I never ever would have imagined that I would be doing um but somehow I managed to get in these rooms so yeah that's me <laughs> and I'm just so thrilled you're you, you're in the very last chapter of the book with um, um you know well your mum's an amazing actress we mustn't forget her. So we've mentioned her in that chapter. Yeah. Again, she's she's such a subtle and lovely actress. I, I can't say actor. I'm always going to say actress. And um, um, says it too, doesn't she? It says in the book that she says actress too. Yeah. Um, but you know, and I say that you know, in the, in the early '60s, I think there was a movement of angry young men, working class people, who stormed the stage, mm. British stage, which was all kind of gentlemen from Oxford and Cambridge, mm. you know, acting, directing, it, it was their world. And then these raw, amazing plays were written and, you know, changed the face of theatre. And I say at the end of this, your chapter and the book, you are like those angry young men who stormed the British theatre, you're doing your storming in a different way. And um, and the future is remarkable, I think. Um, yeah. uh, so well done you. We can have, I'll go back to Amina now. Amina, what would you like us to do now? 
Okay, so I, I can ask some questions as well. I just need my team to um, start my video again. Okay, yeah, great. Um, yeah, I was just going back. Um, that That's fascinating to hear that story in, in terms of how um, productivity and creativity and a response to stereotyping is, is kind of leading to further new work. And, and also, uh, sadly, also to still having to contribute to the industry around radicalization, that that's still quite, you know, often the case that when one gets asked to talk about Muslim representation, that is often uh, the first kind of port of call. And um, which is not to say that it doesn't exist and it's not a problem, but how does one talk about a problem? And Yasmin's uh, very good at talking about that problem and neither so. Uh, you, um, Yasmin, I, was, I, I, I just wanted to pick up a fun fact from your book, uh, from your introduction, and I wanted you to expand on this a little bit, because when, when that sort of process that, that you have as a writer of what gets you started, what are the inspirations, what are the kind of blocks that come your way, and what sort of pushes you to, you know, why is this book called Ladies Who Punch, and why isn't it called Men Who Punch, or, I mean, I know it wouldn't be, but... But one of the one of the points you uh, make in your introduction is you say Sunil, an old uni acquaintance, sent a teasing email when I told him the title. So it's about women who hit their husbands. Um, so I just I just wondered. Um, I mean you, and I I mean that's a light-hearted comment, but I know that on your your uh, active presence on social media, you're an activist as much as you are a writer and a journalist, and you face a lot of trolling. And I wondered if you could, could talk to us about that in relation to ladies who punch, you know, because trolling is, is a very um, common practice and has actually come out. You mentioned the Me Too uh, movement as well. And, and Harvey Weinstein and that sort of trolling has become very much a part and parcel of of, of a backlash against women who do um, punch or, or yeah, those and, who and, speak and, out. And I'm not just a woman, well I'm a woman and I'm a woman of colour and I'm a migrant and I'm a Muslim and I'm Maori. And so the trolling has actually reached a point where I am finding it quite unbearable quite unbearable. I don't look at most of it because otherwise I couldn't do anything. But of course other people do and so they tell you. And it's become, I mean, astonishingly uh, um, crude and cruel and disabling. Mm -hmm. And um, what, you know, they're not going to, I mean, one of the things they want, I think, is to drive you away, to silence you, to disappear you. And I'm not going to do that. I'm too bullheaded to let these cretins and vile racists and misogynists and misanthropes silence me. But if I'm honest, it really is affecting me. Mm -hmm. And so constantly, I mean, the way it, it kind of works its way through is how exhausted I feel at the moment. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm constantly tense because I know this is happening out there. And, you know, I could say, I could, and I'll test it. After we finish, I'll just uh, tweet and say, there's a lovely sunset. And then you'll just read what they say. I'll tell you what they'll say. Why are you still here? Why don't you F off where you came from? You said you would leave when Boris Johnson was elected. Why are you here? We don't want people like you here. How dare you? How... I just have to say I like the sunset. And that will set them up. So, and I'm finding it hard. But mm. the, the bastards aren't going to stop me. Mm. Mm. I'm just... I'm too, I've been through too much in my life to, to let these sorts of cowards get me down. But it is getting me down. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, of course. Of no, and I'm sorry that I, I kind of brought it into, into the conversation, but I wanted to get to the heart of 
the women who inspired you in this book when when you're in moments of darkness and you you really struggle to find uh, the light and to find you know uh, something that will make you go on and and you know where we are glad that you go on because of course that's very important um who are the women in your book you know they're they're people the book is divided into three sections if if i remember correctly correct me if i'm wrong and you've got um You've got Mary Seacole, you've got Cornelia Sorabji, who you spoke about, you've got Sophia Dulip Singh, and uh, and amongst them, you've also got uh, Mary Lee Berners-Lee, um, you've got Margaret Thatcher, you've got Princess Diana. Could you tell us a little bit about this mix? And, and, and also, while I've asked you this question to say to the audience, please keep putting your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom, and we'll pick them up shortly. I think the women who most inspired me when I was writing the book were the youngest women in the book. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when I look at uh, Caroline Prader Perez and, as I said, Renietta Lodge or Laura Bates or um, um, Nyla Levy, I get such a sense that they are, it's the way they grew up and the country they grew up in, which is very different from the country we've now ended up in, we're in a bad bit of the cycle at the moment. And when I think of how I was at their age, I just never had their inner strength, their determination, their skills, you know, that are based on a kind of um, a selfhood that I, I, I find really inspirational, really inspirational. Of course, there are heroines from the past and the present, Elena Kennedy, um, Harriet Wistrick, you know, these two lawyers who between them have really promoted women's rights. Um, but the, it's the younger women I take, I took most um, sucker from. I just think I'll be dead not, not many years from now, but the, it's in good hands. Mm -hmm. This is in good hands, mm -hmm. and they will make, they will do much more than we were able to do. Mm -hmm. In the past, um, um, in the past women, I included some women who were only recently passed away as well as uh, more historical figures. And one of the women I most loved, who sadly passed away, well, I loved um, Deborah Orr, my fellow uh, journalist. I thought she was one of the best writers, and she didn't give a damn. She didn't give a damn. But at the end of her life, personal pain destroyed her and illness. But, oh, oh boy, she was a somebody. But it was Elise Dodson, who was the one of the artistic uh, directors at the Royal Court Theatre. We hardly know her in this country, but she took theatre mm -hmm. to every part of the world and established a new tradition. You know, India never had much of a theatrical tradition it's for film industry. Elise mm. went uh, and with the Royal Court and they established and the play, play writing that has developed in the last 10 years in India, in Chile, in Uganda, this one extraordinary New York Jewish woman mm was a force of nature. And so there are lots of women who should be known, mm. who I wanted to highlight because you know they, they are so remarkable. And then people like Margaret Thatcher, why did I have her in there? Good question. I loathed her everything she was. But nobody can take away from her that she was the first leader um, uh, uh, of in a country leader, not only in Britain, but in Europe, mm -hmm. which you cannot deny her that. Um, so sometimes there were some quite strange choices I made, because um, I didn't want it to be just about my best friends. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, some of the women I don't like. Mm -hmm. Hey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's interesting to hear that and to understand that and and yeah I think this this government actually make Margaret Thatcher look quite good, um, so it's um, it, we we live in interesting times right um, the 
the, I was just wondering, Yasmin, I mean, I, I know your story. I've watched the play. I've, I've kind of, um, the one woman show that you did many years ago. And, and, you know, we've, I've had the, the kind of privilege of having lots of conversations, but I was just wondering for the sake of our audience, if you could share that story, which is such an important story from, from about where, just as Nyla did with regards to where you, who you were and who you've become and what, what was that journey so that people get, I guess. Well, you know, essentially, um, we were thrown out of Uganda in 1972. Asians who had been there for two or three generations, mass expulsion. Um, and it was a very wounding, soul destroying history. Um, and it was very difficult in some ways. Uh, for us to remake our lives. But I've always felt that we only told, half told the story. We really didn't address some of the more problematic things that were happening while we were there. And so the one woman show, for example, was about three things. One was, it was called, um, what was it called? Ex uh, Extravagant Stranger, which comes from Othello. Um, how the migrant is regarded. You try your hardest to belong, and yet nothing you do will ever be enough. And yet there's all this pressure on why aren't you becoming more British? Who could be more British than I am? I even married one of them. You know, a lovely working class white man, but it's never enough. And so like Othello struggling to belong and then realizing, you know, so. That was part one part of the story. The other part was Asian racism against black people. It's not been addressed. We have, we've never addressed it. And I recently wrote, I think Black Lives Matter has really changed, beginning to change that. Younger generations are confronting their elders because they don't think like them. But certainly in East Africa, where I was growing up and in India and in South Asia generally, um, dark skin, was detested. Uh, uh, people with dark skin, even if they were Indian, were demeaned. And it goes back to kind of caste colorism and then the colonial system, which mm -hmm. had these gradations, you know, white at the top, brown at the bottom. So that was the second story in that one woman show. And the third story was a very personal one about my relationship with my father, because I played Juliet. But Nyla, I, I don't know if she knows, my dream was to be an actress. That's what I wanted. It ended on this night that I'm about to describe. So um, all the schools were separate, but after independence, black kids started to come to our school for the first time. And we started to mix. We never mixed. We never mixed with black people. They were our servants. And then suddenly there were our school friends, you know, which was amazing. And we had an English teacher who's still alive, who decided that she would stage Romeo and Juliet with the Capulets playing, um, uh, Asians playing Capulets and Montagues played by Africans. And I got the part of Juliet, who was a black Romeo. Sorry. And I never told them at home what I was doing. It was school, you know, it's fine, it's school. The play got into the press because we won an award and I actually got a scholarship to come study acting. When, my, when I came home with this envelope, my clan was sitting there looking like somebody had died. I thought somebody had died. Anyway, I had a terrible, they beat me up. They, it was a horrible, horrible evening of unbelievable rage. And, but my father didn't hit me or anything, but he never spoke to me again till he died. And that is at the heart of my anti-racism. It is what drove me to become who I became, um, in sum. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin, for sharing that. I think that's a really important uh, insight into who you are and, and that that oppression is, is, is a very real oppression for a lot of people and uh, the not talking is, is, is 
quite uh, substantially um, demeaning or distancing and, and sort of changes you in lots of ways. So there, there are some shout outs for you, Yasmin, that I'm going to read because we were talking about trolling before and, and some from our wonderful team who is in the background, uh, Danny and Stephanie. And um, but this one is from Danny. Um, <clears throat> and um, she says, your examples of strength and perseverance is what keeps us going. And there's a message from Josephine um, in the audience who's a scientist and occasionally corresponds with you. So um, she just says how much you, she admires your tenacity and patience to seek solutions in the public eye. And uh, being on the front line of racial discrimination is tiring and you're a role model, should be in your own book. <laughs> uh, so so the play needs to convert into a book. And, and uh, Danny's asking, can we have a link to the article? Um, and, and you know many many more messages coming up about your support in support of your warrior spirit so there's some questions one question has come up from pat and one question is from suman so i'll to bring nyla back into the conversation let me start with a question for for nyla from suman um nyla suman asks suman butcher um the i i think needs no introduction they're doing um but from butcher boulevard and their wonderful verbatim production is on tomorrow night if you have time decolonizing not just a buzzword i would invite all of you to tune in at five o'clock it's going to be wonderful um suman asks the question um does, does nyla think nyla do you think your experience mirrors your mother's experience as an actor and if so, what has changed over the decade in acting, theater and performance? Um, I think it's different because I think my mom, you know, both of her parents were Asian. Um, so when she's playing those roles, she actually fully understands them. Whereas the roles that I was playing, I didn't really have any connection to at all until I played them. Um, so I was in So the Butcher's Child of the Divide, and that was about um, a young boy who gets split up from his family during partition. And I didn't even, me and the rest of the cast didn't even know much about partition until we did the play and had to do the research for it. So for me, I feel like, you know, I think it's totally different. I, it's like I'm learning, I've learned about my culture through being a performer and through doing a lot of, um, those Asian roles so I think yeah I'm not entirely sure how it was I mean my mum was doing the same kind of roles I guess back in her day um but I think it is different because for me and I know for my sister as well who's mixed race it's hard because we play these Asian roles but with being mixed race not being brought up with the language because the midwife told my mum not to speak to us in Urdu because it would be confusing you know I think there's a disconnect between the characters that we play, uh, but then being put in those boxes, but then also not being enough to fit that box. Um, so I think that's kind of where my frustration is. And that's what's led for me to kind of write my own roles. Cause I'm like, either I wouldn't be getting these roles or I'm not enough to be these roles or my, you know, um, yeah. Did that answer that question? Mm -hmm. Um, I hope so. And and Suman is also giving a shout out to Nyla's sister, Sophie Khan Levy, who's in the show tomorrow. So another so you have to watch Nyla. I will. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> have to. Have to, definitely. And I think just to pick up on that point about language, I think that's really um interesting to hear. And it's something I've grappled with as a as being a mum um being a mother myself to to my daughters and being in a mixed race relationship and uh, the fact that my husband doesn't speak Urdu but I do and no no midwife said to me do not speak to your children in in um, Urdu and, and of course all the kind of learning has changed around that and we're encouraged to to be bilingual and multilingual yeah. etc yeah. But despite that, it's it's not easy. It's not easy, even in a multicultural city like London, to practice that. And it could partially be the fault of being a bilingual speaker, you know, that you just slip into the language that you're comfortable with. But that that's the key point. 
the language you're comfortable with and the environment that makes you comfortable in that language. So a lot of the East European mums are always talking to their children in their own language because English is, is not that, you know, it's not that colonial heritage of being easily able to slip into the other language. And and so I find that, a, you know, a, a kind of thing that I live with as a parent and as a mum. And uh, I did speak to them in, in Urdu when they were younger, but I was very self-conscious in, in public spaces and about th this kind of knowledge, this, I, you know, this be needing, like you said, needing to decolonize yourself in the process of being part of that journey. And, and in fact, you know, I would say that uh, what you were also saying about not connecting with your Asian self is something that I worry about and see a little bit in, in my children as well. And I want, you know, it then makes you think about the structures, you know, what are the structures and, and what you're saying with regards to to not connecting with the story of partition mm -hmm. and 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 it, it's really important that the work of of um of sort of companies like butcher boulevard like tamasha and all all the wonderful people the television programs we've had the historians obviously working in the background in terms of changing and transforming that narrative but then as yasmin reminded with with a minister who comes and uh, says no you know you will not decolonize because this is not possible uh, so so we live in in very very challenging times um yasmin there's a question for you from pat what would you advise someone who wants to get published about a multicultural fiction and how does one find a mentor slash critical friend from Rabia? So Rabia, um, you are lucky uh, to be wanting to do this now because there's never been a better time actually. So there are some things you can immediately look up. Look up, uh, there's a Leeds prize for um, multicultural writing or something. And although it's a prize, it's also a very good source of advice for emerging uh, minority ethnic uh, writers. And I'm sorry, terms are so problematic, so I'm just going to use these terms knowing how problematic they are. The other person who has been wonderful, actually, is a guy called um, uh, Nikesh Shukla. I don't know if you've heard of him. And he edited a book. Uh, which was a bestseller again, called The Good Immigrant. And he has set up several organizations to encourage fiction writers of Asian, Black, mixed race and every background and offers some very serious help to them. So look those two things up, Nikesh Shukla and um, the Leeds something prize for fiction and you will be put on the right road. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I was um, going back to that question of identity. I was wondering if you could talk, talk to us a little bit, Yasmin, about um, Andrea Levy, who's also in, in your book of um, Ladies Who Punch. And uh, I'll read the bit that, that really, um, I think connects with some of the conversation that you've been we've been having and it's about identity she wrote sometimes it makes my head hurt sometimes my heart so what am i where do i fit in into britain could could you sort of share a little bit more with us yeah like i said you know identity politics can get us into such a cul-de-sac sometimes so i'm often not you know who am i what am i me, I'm talking about me now. I'm born in Africa of uh, Indian origin, of un undivided India. But my mother was also born in Africa, in what is Um I come from a Shia Muslim background. Um, I feel an affinity to the subcontinent. I speak three of the languages but I don't belong there. I went back to Uganda last year because my husband had never been. And the minute I got off the plane, 
I felt a part of me had come home, that it isn't my home anymore. It did, just can't be my home anymore. But the emotional reaction I had was like a little girl's. The, the scenery, my first paintings were of those, those uh, banana trees, the goats, desert goats, you know. So there's the homeland of the imagination where I was born from which I was expelled. India uh, and Pakistan, sort of um, the identities that were embraced by East African Asians in a very odd way, I have to say. So we watched all the movies and I loved the movies and I loved the songs, but we were so, we had such a split uh, a loyalty thing going on. So when India became independent and all the Gandhi and Nehru and all of that, Asians in East Africa celebrated end of empire, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. When the empire ended in East Africa, they wept. Because actually we had been brought over and had become agents of the system. And most East African Asians were terrified of what black politicians would do to the country and to Asians. And they were right to be terrified because of course, were, this was ethnic cleansing that, cleansing that happened. So we were sort of so split in so many different ways. So who am I? I have a kind of link to the subcontinent. A lot of the languages gives you values. My home language is a very esoteric language called Kachi, which I used to speak with my mother every day. And since my mother passed away, that part of me is dying. In fact, I'm in the middle of writing a piece about it. Then I'm, I'm married, I was married to somebody from my own background. I have a son from that marriage. And then I, he ran off with a blonde as they do. And then I married an Englishman. I have a mixed race daughter. So who am I? I just can't identify myself in terms of identity politics. I'm a Muslim, but hey, you know, I'm a very open-minded Muslim. I come from a Shia com community where actually we're kind of Muslim light in some ways, but at the same time, there's, there's, it's very conventional. For example, they hate what I do because they are very scared of the written word and they think I'm too outspoken and that the only way for us to be is to be quiet and to make whoever is in power feel good. Okay, I can't do that. So identity politics and all of us, if we are really honest, we could not come up with one identity that defines us. And in that sense, Naila, you are like the rest of humanity. Everybody has so many bits. Then I'm a woman, right? Mm -hmm. a, a black, Asian, African woman. So, and I'm really pleased. Nobody can put me in a box. I think um, <clears throat> so. I think connected, Yasmin, to what you've been talking about there as, is a question um, from Rubina, who says, Do you think it's fair to use the word, I mean, connected, but just taking it in a new direction? Do you think it's fair to use the word grooming for girls who are old enough to have angry political views on Western incursions? into Iraq, etc., with complete impunity. The media frequently also uses the virgins in heaven to ridicule and dismiss the political anger that reactive young people feel. So I think it's a question for, for you and for Nyla because it connects with, with the play as well and the work that you've done. And, and Yasmin, perhaps this is also with regards, you know, brings in the work that you've done on, on mental health. I think it, I'm going to give it to Naila very quickly. I think it's a fair enough word, word because it's age is not maturity. And many of our young people, and by our, I, I am being inclusive of all the Muslim um, families and um, communities in this country and elsewhere. Um, we grow up in a very different way, most of us, you know, or we grew up in a very different way from Western uh, women. 
And so we may be of a certain age. I mean, I was so innocent at the age of 18. I was more innocent than an 11 year old is today. So I don't think it's age. And I do think it's, it's, it's the right word to use. I think political anger is one thing. Political anger that is so violent is something that is destructive for everybody, including the person who's been drawn into it. Political anger expressed, you know, in terms of, in every other way I would support. But when it kind of is into, you know, Taliban and, and ISIS and Al Qaeda, it, it has to be a kind of brainwashing that leads them there. And I think we should not avoid that conclusion. Uh, nobody could be, I mean, I sometimes, somebody said to me, you're still angry. At your age, most people have become conservatives and are, you know, drinking wine. Why are you still so angry? And I'm really pleased I'm angry. But if that anger makes me want to destroy other people, then I, it would be the wrong use of that anger. But Nyla can come in on this and mute myself. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, for the word grooming with regards to the play and the characters in my play, um, I do think that that's appropriate for the way that they were drawn in, sucked into that world. Um, because, you know, when I was talking to Tasneem Kunji, I'd kind of referenced, you know, my childhood growing up, and he'd said that was just one version of a rebellion. And because of the certain circumstances and people that in, she encountered in her life, that's that path that she went down. So I think for that particular young person at that stage in her life, who was extremely vulnerable um, and who, yeah, she did have these, you know, engagements in areas of politics. And, you know, I think that we can see it with the far right as well, that, you know, they. There's something that is happening that is angering them. And yes, that is their political viewpoint, but then other things happen in order to push them to this certain um, place point in their lives. And definitely through the research that I did with ISIS, they do have these people on these computers whose job is to go out and to groom people. And, you know, there was that Scottish um, woman who was able to relate to them and be you know I'm from England too and I'm from Britain too and I've been able to I, I understand what you're going through so it was a little connector and they man manipulated them very much so um so in terms of that just that specific um character that I wrote about I would use the word grooming um yeah yeah Um, uh, thank you both for responding to that. I mean, while we're on the subject of politics, let me return to Yasmin's book again. And Yasmin, there are a couple of political women I want you to talk to us about in the book. There are many. Uh, we mentioned Margaret Thatcher already. But I want uh, to turn to the to the MP and um, the the well, the minister who was with that portfolio, um, Rupak and uh, Saeed Awasi, who are both in Baron Saeed Awasi, both of them are in your book. Can, can you tell us what um, was the inspiration and what do you see with regards to their, pol you know, what are the politics from the perspective of an MP, from the perspective of also those who are at, further down the chain to community politics? And then right up at the top where say uh, Baroness say the Wasi was, and where once you express an opinion that doesn't sit well, um, you have to kind of step outside the frame. It was a really difficult, really difficult choice um, because how many wonderful MPs are there? And I could have chosen, you know, I feel, you, I feel so bad. I could have had Diane Abbott, I could have had um, so many amazing white women like Stella Creasy and um, a couple of women I would have had uh, Des Phillips but she uh, because the election was suddenly thrown at us and she couldn't do the interview but the reason I think Rupa is so interesting is she's a middle-class Bangladeshi woman um, but she is 
absolutely grounded, absolutely rooted in, 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 in the constituency, and it's, it's where I live as well. And the, the, she has this amazing capacity. Whoever she's talking to, she's one of them. And she genuinely is. So she's, she's also multi-talented. So she's a DJ. She's a stand-up comic. And one of, say, one of the amazing things she did in this locality, we have a Mari Stopes clinic where abortions are performed. Legal abortions are performed. And for the last three or four years, anti-abortion is absolutely awful, awful, uh, extremist anti-abortionists have been circling this place and really making it hard for the women going in, holding up pictures of bloody fetuses, shouting at them, screaming at them. And so she got the local council, after a long struggle, to ban them from that area. And now this, I think, is going to be put, in, put to parliament so that women who need an abortion will be protected. And I just thought, that, you know, we think this is only a Northern Ireland problem, but anti-abortionist um, um, campaigns and campaigners have become very emboldened in the last three or four years in this country. They're funded by, many of them are funded by American groups. So I really admire her because she, she picks causes that nobody else seems to have noticed. And abortion is a fundamental human right for women. And it might, might be being snatched away in this, by this pressure. She's also, I think, was remarkable. Her first majority, because it's a very Tory area, Ealing has got extremely wealthy people and extremely poor people. And for years it was Tory. I've lived in the same flat that I'm in since 1978. So it, it's, you know, I've watched the story, but when she stood, nobody thought Labour had a chance. She won with about 300 majority. The following election, which was very, very soon, she'd built a majority of thousands. Because there is this earthiness about her, which I love, um, and a, a way that she relates to everybody she's talking to. Saida is a completely different reason she's in there. Uh, you know, I've always said to her, why are you even in the Tory party? What are you doing there? You know, they hate people like you. They hate people like me. Why are you there? But she says, I, if I go, that's what they want. They want me to go away so I don't nag them. I'm not there, you know, putting this into their arena, which they don't want to talk about, what their, their racism against Muslim people in particular, but other forms of racism and exclusion. And I also loved her story, you know, one of five daughters. Uh, the, the book has some amazing fathers in there. So many women, past and present, became what they became because they had these extraordinary fathers. And I wanted to acknowledge the men in the book as well. Um, and her father, absolutely encouraged her and her four sisters to go beyond what they thought was possible. And he's still doing it, she tells me. He's still doing it. And I also think that she's tackling an issue which is increasingly hard to talk about in this country, which is the plight of the Palestinian people. And that takes some courage these days. Uh, and she holds on to it. So and she gets punished for it. So I thought it was very important to honor her because she is something, somebody, you know, that's real bravery, I think. I think so, a lot of bravery and a lot of admiration for, for those women. And um, I can also, as you mentioned, uh, Palestine, I should also flag, we have uh, Susan Abul Hava uh, from, at seven o'clock in conversation. Um, in our festival, so please do tune in to, to that as well. Um, there, if you, Let's go back to the questions from the audience and some comments. Um, Jana has uh, shared a quote, 
that she thinks really fits with what Yasmin has said about her identity. And it's from The Good Immigrant uh, by Shukla that you mentioned, uh, by Nikkei Shukla. Uh, she says, we have, uh, and, the, and the quotation is by S. Godden, we have learned to belong in the unbelonging, spirited and colorful souls of all shades. Okay, so that, that was a comment. Um, going back to question from Pat, did you have discriminate and this is for Yasmin did you have discrimination with jobs in journalism and perhaps uh, Naila could extend to you um, with regards to any experiences you might have had of discrimination so I became a journalist at the age of 37 and I'm completely untrained so after the acting career was dashed my next dream was to be a writer but of course when you come as an immigrant to a country and you don't know anybody and it's a very nepotistic um, um, uh, occupation. I lost confidence after being at Oxford. Um, and so I, 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 did, I became an educator. I worked in adult education, further education, and so on. And at the age of 37, woke up one morning and said, you've got to do this because you'll die and you'll regret it. So I wrote a column. I got up and I, wrote, I couldn't even type. And I wrote a column very slowly. And I knew one person at The Guardian, a uh, guy um, uh, uh, called Aidan White. And I showed it to him. And he said, oh, this is quite good. Shall we send it and see what they say? So he sent it to The Guardian. And they published it. And, and so it began. So I started doing bits and pieces. I started writing and pitching here, there, and everywhere. And within six months, I had a job at a wonderful magazine we used to have called New Society, uh, which sadly died after many decades. And it was a mixture of academic, social work, literature, um, current affairs, and so on. And I got a job there as, uh, and to edit a section of the magazine called Race and Society. So within six months of waking up that morning and actually sitting down and doing it, um, luck has a lot to do with these things, but also passion, because I knew I had to do this. There's been a huge amount of discrimination all the way, and there still is. Uh, some of it is quite naked, but it's, it's, it's that bullheadedness in me, I suppose. Um, I carry on. I do carry on. Um, so the longest I've ever been in a kind of safest job was when I was with the independent newspaper for 18 years. And I have to say, the, the people who've helped me most on this journey have almost all, except for two, been white men. So good white men are our best friends, can be our best friends as much as anything else. Anyway, one of them gave me a column on the independent. I was there for 18 years. Um, and then one day, unceremoniously, with a text, I was sacked. Um, and, uh, you know, almost none of the men, male columnists, were sacked. But a lot of wi other wi women, uh, white women, were sacked. And it, and, and it was clear to us, you know, that choices had been made. And then after all that, I realized that I'd had such a pathetic contract with them, whereas my white peers had a proper contract. They had holiday pay. They had all, and I only found that out within the last two years. So I won awards. I, I did all this, but you always know that there are things happening in the structure, as you say. But mm -hmm. I've also done what I wanted to do, and I've loved every minute of it and every time i get up to write i feel something that is unimmeasurable it is what i want to do and and the discrimination you have to just put that aside and not let it diminish your sense of worth your ambition and your passion they've tried they've often tried to diminish me including liberal journalists from the guardian but they can't. 
-hmm. That's a powerful statement, Yasmin. And I think one of the questions I'd like to ask you with regards to discrimination and, and institutional structures and um, you know, I, I, I think the, the message to continue um, despite, in spite of, of those who discriminate against you is a very important one and one a lot of people, um, including myself, you know, will, will sort of take from that and, and participate in that. But it's also allows the system to perpetuate a, a practice that is then becomes a, norm, a normative structure. So how and what, you know, it's it's good that you're speaking out and you're saying those things at what point, you know, in 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 one's career, you know, as people are asking, do you have the power to speak out? Because there will be many who will have gone through that same experience and there will be most people will not speak out, will not be empowered to speak out. And this is a question of the of the power of the law as well when it comes to racial discrimination. You know, to what extent does the law help us to change those structures? I mean, I know you're not a lawyer, but I, I, I don't know whether you, you've kind of encountered that, that journey in, in your own um, experiences. No, I've never, I've never used the law. And I think it's becoming increasingly harder to use the law. I so admire what uh, Carrie Gracie, who's in my book, and Samira Ahmed did. They mm -hmm. used the law but they worked, they had proper jobs, proper contracts with a proper employer. Mm -hmm. I've never had that luxury. I'm a kind of tramp. Mm -hmm. I go from job to job to job. I, and I'm not proud. I'm really not proud mm -hmm. because I love what I do so much. And maybe I should have been prouder and maybe I should have raised objections. But the thing that drives me is I want to wake up after I was sacked, I, I almost had a breakdown. And then I thought that that's, the, you know, you've got to, because I missed the writing. Writing is like food and drink to me. So I approached the I newspaper and I said to them, please let me write. Um, and here is what I said at my age, with my background and my achievements, here is what I said. I said, pay me whatever you like, but just let me write. Okay, it was, I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. That's what I did. Three months later, I won columnist of the year in the National uh, uh, Press Awards. Mm -hmm. So the stock went up mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm writing for them and I love writing for them. But I can't say to anyone, do what I did because Sometimes I think I should have been much more assertive. Mm. I did leap. I did walk out of one job, mm. my first, mm. uh, second proper job. So when New Society, I was incredibly happy. New Society merged with New Statesman. Mm. And the editor of New Society, who really trained me, mm. Lord Lipsy, he was wonderful. Uh, he left and I had another editor, there was an editor of both the magazines put together. And he was appalling. He was an appalling man in every way. He was sexist. He was uh, uh, kind of had terrible prejudices. And th this was at the time of the satanic verses. And until then, I'd never said to anybody, I'm a Muslim. And when the satanic verses thing happened and the liberal world was very shaken uh, and I understood that they were shaken, you know, I think a lot of mistakes were made by Muslims at the time by burning the book and so on. But anyway, we won't go there. But I remember the editor at conference saying, we are not going to cover the Muslim side of the story. And I said, well, why, what kind of a decision is that for a left-wing magazine to make? Okay, I don't think it's right for what's been happening. But surely, we, we, uh, there was a, a wonderful guy called Shabir Akhtar, who was an in, intellectual, and who had been writing some very interesting counterpositions on freedom of expression and so on. 
And I thought, this is awful. I have an editor who's declared that he's not interested in what Muslims think. And he was also treating the women very badly. So I left that job. Um, and, you know, this was just about a year after I changed careers. I was a lone mother. Uh, it was a really tough thing to do. But other than that, I've never, never, never walked away. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that, that's just the way a decision I made that it was I wanted to write. What I do do now, though, because I am respected and I know I kind of have a, I've done what I've done, that if people treat me badly now, I'll say, you don't do that to me. Mm -hmm. Okay? But that's it. Good, uh, good for you, and uh, good to hear that that story about because every story is individual and every story is important in terms of how we deal with those challenges. And and generationally, I'm really interested to hear um, what Nyla might um, have to say on this as well. So, Nyla, would you would yeah. you come in? Um, I think in terms of discrimination, I think. For my writing, I've been positively discriminated against or like kind of benefited. Um, positively affirmed, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, but then at the same time, there is a thing of like, oh, but it's a scheme. It's like, no, well, yeah, we're doing a BAME thing, BAME scheme. And it's like, well, why don't you just commission us? Because we've done X, Y, and Z before. Um, so there's that kind of a battle of like, oh, you can be associated with this brilliant uh, production company theatre everything but it's a scheme so I think yeah I think it's great that they're getting people in but also it's still a thing isn't it of like well can we just have what we should be you know deserve at this level um and then and then it was interesting what Yasmin was saying about white men being your best friend because um after writing bomb it was actually some asian peers who were saying that i wasn't asian enough to write certain stories so you know which was quite a i mean i've had it of course i've had it all my life but i didn't really think that it would also be within the industry that i believe is kind of at a certain level that my peers are at a certain level and are kind of engaged in a different way than people were back at back in the day 10 years ago at school um so it was very strange for me to be like wow okay it's coming from within the community that I was kind of felt like I was part of but now I'm obviously not you know well these people don't think I am enough um so yeah so there's yeah mm -hmm. so. I think that's really interesting that that uh, and and you know an experience that a lot a uh, lot of us have of support from white men but i also wonder if we could push that a little bit further and say to what extent is that white man supported within the structural um narrative of whiteness that makes them gives them the possibility more and i mean it can be of course a completely benevolent exercise uh but also structurally is is it poss more possible for that person to do it than it is for the person who is is sort of not as powerful, empowered or powerful. It feels like they are still the gatekeepers. And even though, I mean, I'm not actually working with a, a lot of white men who are actually there. So that wasn't necessarily what I was saying. But I do think there is this, in this, in Asian culture, there is the kind of um, unfortunate mentality of pull the ladder up behind you, which I still think is affecting us um, and is, something that we have to figure out have to, you know because it's like we can be the only one at the table actually there's not room for everybody else but of course there is so much room because we are all different there's not one homogenous um asian experience or like you know third generation asian experience in britain like we all have stuff to say um i think it's about being being brave enough to let everyone up, up at the table not so scared, I think. I think it comes from fear. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that, that that's but, very. Um, I, I think I don't think about it like that. I think the white men who do stick up and, and actually open up the space are often taking a very big risk. Mm -hmm. Because 
I remember when, you know, it, it was Ian Birrell, uh, who is a, a columnist now, who gave me my first column. He was the deputy editor of the Independent at the time. And, you know, I was crap, really. I knew nothing, you know, I thought I wanted to do this, but it was a terrifying responsibility and from him and for me, because he had brought in somebody who was not part of the circle. Mm -hmm. He did that a lot, actually, you know, um, and, uh, but he was a good mentor and he stood by me. When I was sacked from the independent, the editor was an Asian man. Mm -hmm. I make no other comment on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a that's a very important point that you've raised as well, because it is it's not to say the color of your skin that determines uh, the actions. It, it It is, you know, I, I think it is much more um, complex than that. And, and you've precisely illustrated why those connections are important to recognize and understand to not make it a very simplistic um, sort of division amongst people, but but to look beyond those boundaries and to see where where those people are that are taking the risks. And I, I just wanted to say this, especially if there are students listening, and I say this to my students, it's a very important thing because identity politics makes you think in certain ways and you begin I think to think that you know all white men are the obstacle and the way you get on especially in this industry and probably quite a lot of other industries in the arts and um, um, even in ac academe is I mean the story of Cornelia Sarabji in the book is a very interesting one because she the way she got to where she got to was by befriending or influencing powerful men, mm. men who were so powerful that other men couldn't deny them. So the gatekeepers tried to chop her out of it, and they, they did often, but she befriended you know, the master of Balian College, this, this woman from India who wore saris and who really wasn't accustomed to this, this society, a subject of the empire, manipulated those men and won them over. It wasn't even manipulation. She won them over and got what she wanted. And I say to my, my um, uh, I've said in the book, there are so many ways to skin the patriarchal cat. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's only one way. I'm, I'm so glad you brought up Cornelia Surabji because I was, um, I wanted to refer to your comment in the introduction, um, which you, um, where you refer to include the inclusion of Cornelia Sarabji and being asked by a British Asian academic as to why you're doing that and, and uh, saying uh, she was no feminist, opposed Gandhi and independence all her life. So why? And you, and you say you acknowledge that that's a very important question to to. And I, and I think you've just answered it in terms of how you've put her in. So should we turn to some questions from the audience um, in the next sort of 10 minutes before we wrap up, as it were, because because we can just carry on. This is um, fascinating. Um, so there's a question from Iman Imanji. I love to write, but have self-censored myself for so long about what I can write about, even privately. And I'm finding it difficult to be honest about wanting to write honestly. How did each of you break through some of those social barriers which discourage us from speaking honestly and critically of both Western and Eastern culture and society? Such an excellent question. You should get a prize for the question. Okay. Because this is, this is, this is the struggle. Um, you know, especially for communities who are experiencing discrimination, this, this tug in your heart that you mustn't expose the bad side of them, that you would, that by doing that, you're exposing them to more nastiness and, and so on, that you can't be honest about your family, um, your father, your mother, your, you know, we're all raised like that. But I, I honestly believe you cannot be a writer 
of any kind unless you are prepared to be disloyal and to speak with that voice that's inside you. And, and if you can ask a question like this, you are already a writer. Uh, you are already thinking like a writer. You have to stop this, these barriers and just put it down. It will never be easy. I wrote a memoir, a food memoir, uh, about 12 years ago, called The Settler's Cookbook. And it was in part to remember my mother who had died and I was missing her so much. But I also was incredibly honest about our family life, how Ugandan nations were in, 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 in Africa and so on and so on. So it was very interesting. I'd written a memoir many years before that um, in the heat of having given birth to my daughter. And about three relatives stopped talking to me after that book. That one was called No Place Like Home. After this one, I think about 11 relatives cut me out. But you know what? They've all come back. After the initial shock, after all that, you can rebuild your relationships with those people you fear you're offending. Give, be honest and let that voice out. You must let it happen. Um, and I think your question tells me you really are a writer. Brilliant. So I think that's a wonderful endorsement uh, there for writing. Um, and there's a, I'm not sure there's a question or a comment from Rubina. I will read it out. I, I think it's a comment. Um, Yasmin, I understand the excitement of returning home to Tanzania. Very all I want, very all I wanted to do is feel the vibrancy, see the flame trees dominated by the culinary delights of eating chili mahogo, roast corn, peanuts. I too realized things weren't as we left them. I sensed a coolness and understandable reaction to Asian racism. Would you like to respond or just acknowledge that as a comment? Exactly how I felt. But I also realized, you know, how wrong we were. One of the terrible myths that I grew up with was, you know, we are the business people. What these when once we're gone, this this the economy will collapse because these people don't know how to do business or run businesses. And yes, the economy did collapse because we were so, uh, you know, immediately thrown out and, and the country went through a very bad patch. The great thing last year was seeing how black businesses are flourishing. Young people in Uganda, again, I go back to young people, they're not touched by colonialism anymore, right? They don't even think about it anymore. They are doing their own thing. They are absolutely building Uganda's business sector. The writers that are coming out of Africa at the moment, astonishing voices. So I was thrilled by that, but I also felt that there was this, you know, lingering resentment so after eating all the lovely food and everything, yes, I felt that too. Okay, great. Um, I'll just turn to a question for Nyla from Rose Taylor. Great discussion. I have a question. How has your Jewish heritage influenced, impacted your life and acting slash writing? Um, do you know what? I was thinking, well, thinking about the previous question on, um, oh gosh, what was it? I'm trying to find it now. It's just, it's just made me think of a time that was it of discrimination, right? And I think my experience of being Jewish actually was when I was writing, um, was writing, well, doing research for Does My Bomb Look Big in This? And I was doing um, research within the Muslim community in Luton. And it was actually there that I kind of experienced anti Semitism for the first time since school. Um, because they were like, who the hell are you writing this story? Your surname is Levy. And I was just like, my God, in my, you know, my day-to-day -day life, I'm only ever seen as like, a, you know, Asian or Muslim. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of a bit of a, a, a shocker of not being, um, not being accepted in that Muslim community in that way. And then kind of being seen as somebody who was trying to come and write the story from a, from a specific angle. Um, 
actually it was related to the other self-censorship question because I went through a point when I was researching for my play and I was like god should I be telling this story do I want to be adding to the uh, young Muslim girl terrorist like no I don't want to be doing that but I also want to explore explore this story and you know the reality is at that period in time people were being radicalized you know ISIS still exists so we need to explore this and why can't I be the person to write it but I did go through a lot of things of being like shit maybe I just make her you know just a normal Muslim girl and we don't touch that subject because people are going to come for me and I mean people came for me in the Q&A as well of who do you think you are writing this but it was that thing of just ignoring all the outside voices because you can't please everybody you know and just writing something and some people would hate it or whatever but actually the women who didn't want to talk to me um for research for the play they did speak to me but they wouldn't let me speak to uh, young muslim girls from luton because of course they didn't want to be associated in any way shape or form which i understood um because of the prevent program and how that had completely ruined their lives um, so they didn't want any association so they couldn't get into any trouble so you know that was their reasoning for not speaking to me but then they did come and see the play and they thought it was brilliant you know so I think people see what they see from the outside and you know they become really guarded and everything but once they actually see what you've written and I think that um, that person who'd asked that question seems like they've got a an issue that they really want to explore and I think it's your you know whatever your experience is and whatever you want to write just get it down there and I'm gonna say it fuck the haters <laughs> okay thank you Nyla for being totally honest and upfront I think it's brilliant um anonymous attendee says thank you very much for this amazing conversation as a Kurdish Turkish woman myself that grew up in four different countries I still struggle to associate myself with one identity I hope to have the power one day to remold my discriminated and marginalized heritage do you have any suggestions for women like myself to get their voices heard Yasmin I think like I said, there are so many now amazing groups, writing groups. Um, um, one of the other people in my book, um, uh, Kit Duval, for example, who is mixed race from Birmingham, who became a writer at, I think when she was nearly 60 or something, uh, coming to the end of her 50s, wrote her first novel and has created these schemes for unheard voices. Um, there are so many, if you Google unheard voices, I promise you there will be lots and lots of um, organizations and schemes that come up. People are hungry, people are looking for new stories. And I was very interested, um, I was very interested in the reaction to the uh, two-parter, um, uh, uh, what was it called? Honor, you know, the ITV did the... Yes, yes, I saw and, the first one. And of course it had its problems. You know, some people thought it's again the white heroine, uh, but I didn't feel that. I felt the interest it raised in the lives of these extraordinary sisters, how they were managing to live the lives they wanted or craved within these structures that oppress them was fascinating and a novel about that would be unbelievable actually because you could expand your imagination because that's the one thing in this report we've written which uh, in the lives of troubled young muslims the, the authors are all female muslims so there are six women who've written this report right um and one of the things we discovered was how second and third generation Muslims negotiate their lives and identities and existences almost hour by hour. So the people they are when they come home to their mums are very different from the people they are when they step outside and even go to the post office and they talk a bit like Nyla in the play. And I find that so fascinating. What a skill that is, that they are able to integrate so many different aspects of themselves. Um, and I think that for you, 
search out unheard voices, new voices. Um, and again, Nikesh Shukla has got all kinds of, you know, schemes going, which you could probably benefit from. And also if colleges are teaching creative writing, it would do you no harm to do a, a, a short course on creative writing. Every university is offering creative writing courses. Um, so look those up. Okay, so um, as is always the case when you're having these intense and um, moving conversations, time is against us, but I'm just going to read out the last two questions and ask both of you to quickly respond to them and then, then we need to wrap up because Susan is going to take the stage at seven o'clock and we need to vacate the space for her. Uh, this, Jana says, I would like to ask both of you, I often feel that we as women also have inherent sexist beliefs both about ourselves and also about other women because we're being socialized that way. Do you have any ideas on how we as women can challenge our own sexist beliefs or any experiences or thoughts on that topic? I mean, I, I could answer that quickly and say I highly recommend Yasmin's book, Ladies Who Punch, as a as an answer. Uh, but of course, I'll let, let the two of you come in in a minute. The anonymous attendee question is, is directed at Yasmin. Your approach is precisely what I've been grappling with, trying to write about decolonization in an African context. But where I feel the focus in the literature is mostly one-sided criticism of the colonialism, but not that much about the ongoing roles of African political elite whose actions and inactions have caused a lot of suffering there. What would be your advice? What would be, um, um, yes, the book has ex extraordinary examples. I know for often, women are like Margaret Thatcher, never wanted to be a feminist. And she only ever had one female cabinet member. You know, she just wanted to be the only one. And there is this kind of um, judgment, you know, they're judgmental women who pass judgment on women's morals or how they look. Some of the worst trolls, let me tell you at the moment I have, are females. The worst, they are so horrible to me. Okay, and I think, my God, I'm a woman, and you, ha you know, do you not be any kind of allegiance to the fact that we are both of the, you know, we're both women? Uh uh, not a bit of it. Um, so there is this problem, and but it, it's the same with race. In my view, some of the worst politicians we have at the moment the most authoritarian um, and in, in a kind of unfeeling are <laughs> Asian or black. Um, you know, they are prepared to do the dirty stuff in order to get on, is my view, okay? Priti Patel comes from the same place as I do. I, I have no f words to describe what I feel about her. Um, uh, Munira Mirza, who is a, one of the most powerful people in Boris Johnson's secret circle, <laughs> utterly, utterly devoid of any anti-racism, um, doesn't even accept that there is a problem of racism, so on and so on. Same thing with women, that there are always women who feel, uh, look at the women who vote for Trump. Women vote huge numbers voting for Trump. That's a problem. That's an issue. And we have to, I mean, we can't change them. Um, and, uh, you know, we have to kind of assume that a time comes, and often a time comes when some of these women learn the hard way that whatever you do in, in the treacherous way, in the end, your womanness will be your barrier. I really believe that very strongly. So, um, you know, that's my, what was the second question? Have ever answered both? I think you've answered, uh, you've answered, well, the other one was about decolonization and, and sort of the oh, elite. I totally agree. I yeah, totally yeah. agree. It's mm -hmm. so easy. And it's the same with uh, British Muslims, I feel. It's very, we, we are we're so ready to talk about Islamophobia all the time. 
but we are very reluctant to talk about how women in too many families are suppressed. We're too unwilling to look at how some of what happens within our communities um, is actually more cruel than what is being done outside. I have one template. It's the human rights and equality template. And I use the same one for everybody and, and not make excuses. So yes, the, the decolonization debate is a very important one. But I've been in countries recently where people have said to me in India, in um, East African countries, in um, uh, Arab countries, I wish the British were back. At least there was less corruption. How heartbreaking is that? How heartbreaking is that? That they preferred the colonial system to what they're having to suffer now. Look at Nigeria today. Okay, on, um, we could go on for a very long time. Naila, I'm going to let you come in and have the last word before we sign off. Um, so on the uh, sexist beliefs, I mean, I think, I think the only thing that I'm able to do is to just check myself, you know, when I have them. And it even is like in, if I'm in a meeting or, you know, I, I have this thing when I go in for meetings and if, you know, and if there's a white guy in front of me that I'm talking to, I immediately feel inferior. And I'm like, oh shit, I have no idea what I'm talking about. I must be so stupid. But, and I'm like, why am I thinking like that? I'm talking about my own play, which I wrote. Like, you know, it's like, I, I could be talking about like, whatever, my daily routine and I'd still feel nervous. So it's about, for me, those sexist beliefs that we are, you know, that we are just brought up with, the same as racism, you know, I think you just have to check yourself because, well, that's all that I can do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. On that on that note, you know, more more power to both of you. Thank you for uh, open, frank, down to earth, and uh, buzzing conversation. And congratulations to Yasmin on Ladies Who Punch and um, Nyla. We look forward to your TV shows and wish you every success. Both of you you're brilliant you're doing excellent work we are so proud of you and thank you so much for lending your voices to the SOAS festival of ideas it's been a pleasure to have you on board i'd like to invite everyone to the power of the novel in narrative refugee experience with susan abul hava which is starting at seven o'clock thank you and goodbye for now bye, bye. bye. see ya see ya